Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today, we are happy to have Maggie Reese, author of Runaway Mind and Runaway Mom, doing an interview with us. A little different structure today. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to her to give her a little bio, and then we're going to get started. Go ahead, Maggie. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for listening in today. Um, coming to you from San Diego. Uh, I've lived here for 20 years. Uh, I like the sun, so <laughs> that's why I moved here uh, years ago. And um, I, I do a little bit of writing on the side, and it's uh, it was nice to be able to uh, come out with these both of these books uh, just to help others. Uh, that was not my intention in the beginning. Uh, my first book, I I was telling Nami the other night uh, that I, I came out with that first book because I wanted to be famous because <laughs> that's uh, kind of a typical thing when you have bipolar one and it's all about you. Um, but then it, it did t take some turns and twists and and then I realized it's not about me at all, and it's about helping other people. And uh, and then I was able to uh, figure out how to navigate this illness, and um, you know how to have a successful life, and how to be a mom, how to um, enjoy uh, things that you know before I wasn't able to enjoy. And I like to get outside and you know paddleboard, and got lots of different hobbies and and skills and things like that to. Um, to, just to, you know, again, to get through uh, with bipolar. All right, wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and um, ask the first question. Please go ahead and submit any other questions you have, and we'll go ahead and have Maggie answer them at the end of the interview. So the first question I have is, what are the risks of being bipolar and having a child? Yeah, there there is a lot of risks. Um, I honestly, uh, when I decided to have a kid, uh, let's see, I was about 30 years old, and I hadn't had any episodes uh, since I was 19. And of course, I was on my medication, and I had gone to uh, lots of conferences about what the risk were, risks were um with having bipolar and being a mom and i i at the time really convinced myself that this would not happen to me i had put in 10 years of uh work of uh not having episodes of going to my psychiatrist going to my counselor uh, managing a small day spa here in san diego and uh you know i was, I was married to matt and we had a wonderful relationship so I had just, you know, a great 10 years. And of course, I had a little ups and a little downs. But these major risk factors like, you know, going off your medication um, <clears throat> to have a child, I didn't think that was going to be a big risk. I, I honestly had talked myself into it that nothing would happen, that I would not have another episode. I honestly thought that the hormones wouldn't bother me. I thought I could breastfeed my baby and be fine. Um, I talked everybody in to that everything was going to be fine. My my parents, my husband, my family, my friends, that this would not happen to me, that I was so well um, that this, this um, you know, all these things that can happen, like major postpartum depression, which nobody wants to discuss. I told that to everybody I knew that would not happen. Um, and who knew that um, around the corner was going to be postpartum psychosis, which is even more severe um, and and scary and, and can lead to death of the mother or death of the child, harm to others. And, um, you know, in this day and age, it's still not talked about that much. I know Brooke Shields wrote a book on postpartum um, and she really dove into that. And um, I did not want to write this book because uh, this episode was so much worse uh, than my first book, um, Runaway Mind. Um, and that's all about when I went to college and had a major manic episode. Um, but this, but this episode, the risks are so high because. Um, well, some moms can stay on their medications through pregnancy, and of course, you always want to go through your doctor. 
I chose to get off my medication fully uh, to have Allie and I was off them for a full nine months. Um, and Allie did come early. She came four weeks early. And uh, everything that I had heard about, I even went to a speech to hear Kay Rumsfeld Jameson speak uh, about the risks of um, you know what can happen. Uh, they all happened, unfortunately. And uh, within four days after I had Allie, I was in a full psychosis, full paranoia delusions. Um, I didn't even know I had a child. Uh, it was it was so severe that um, you know I thought everybody was dead for the first two weeks of Allie's life. Um, you know I didn't come out of that for a couple of months. Um, so, but the first two weeks were even were the you know was, the crisis was so bad. I I didn't know I had a baby. So. Um, you know, you have to have like a, some major plans and some major roadmaps in place if, if you're truly going to have that child. And, and, and if you have bipolar and, and look at all of the factors way ahead of time, don't go in blindly like I did thinking you're going to be okay, because there's so many, uh, there's so many things against you. And I don't mean to um, put out like negative and bad news, but I'm just putting out the reality of the situation. When you have bipolar one, it's not, uh, there's not a lot of positive um, things out there, uh, you know, when, you, when you're gonna have a kid. Um, if you can adopt, you know, that's maybe a better route when I'm looking back at what I went through because, you know, I did lose it's like uh, sometimes like my my brain was so broken that it was like my arm was crushed. Right. But it was my brain that was completely fractured and it took years to get that back together where I was a full functioning person. And um, even with medication and great psychiatrists and great counseling, and I still deal to this day, uh, just terrible anxiety and things. Like, I think I still have a little bit of post-traumatic stress from that experience because the brain was so severely damaged, especially with the psychosis. And um, so, you know, with the psychosis, you do not know anything. Um, uh, I didn't even know I had a husband in my house. So <laughs> I thought Matt was dead. Um, and imagine that, you know, didn't know I had a child. I thought my husband was dead. And my mom was constantly saying, no, everybody's fine. So um, you, you have to know all the factors if you're truly going to be a mom and have um, going into it. OK. So the next question is, what are some things you might do differently looking back on your experience in having Allie? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Going back and, and thinking about everything that happened, um, you know, obviously for us, we we didn't have the money to have a surrogate mom, you know, and if, if I did go back and, you know, have Ali just like I did, I would, the, the thing I would change right from the start is I would have a, like a roadmap put in place, like, this is where I need to go if I go, you know, if I go manic or if I'm in a psychosis or if I'm going to a massive depression, uh, let, you know, here's Vista's phone number, here's their location. Like you need to have all the, or, or wherever you are in the U.S., have all these places um, and phone numbers um, be your own advocate. Write all the places down where if you are in major trouble, give your husband or your parents or your friends permission to take you to a facility to help out. I probably should have been in um, a mental health facility looking back because I was in such a dangerous place. At the time, my family thought we could all just uh, manage my problem even though it was so severe. And um, I would definitely, right from the start, not try to breastfeed. That was 
a major problem. I was at Scripps La Jolla Hospital and uh, a, a great hospital, great nurses, and we had told them I had bipolar. Um, you know, I don't think uh, enough people in the, even a lot of the nurses, they don't know enough about what it can do to moms. And right away I was told to breastfeed and, oh, you can do this, you'll be fine. And so I'm trying to learn how to breastfeed at the hospital. I'm staying up all night long. And uh, as you know, with bipolar, um, sleep is so key. Uh, if I miss one night of sleep, I'm kind of a mess the next day. I miss two nights of sleep, even worse. Three to four starts down a destructive path. Um, after having Allie with a C-section, after 22 hours of labor and then no sleep, zero sleep for four days straight, uh, it threw me right into um, the psychosis. Um, by the time I was taken home on the fifth day, fourth or fifth day, um, you know, that's where my brain, it was like somebody took um, a light switch and just flipped it down and and my brain was gone. And so here Matt was celebrating on the golf course and going, yes, we have a new baby and we're so excited and Maggie's okay because in the hospital I was very vibrant and talking to everyone. Um, and what was happening is, you know, my brain was starting to go off kilter. Um, I remember being at the hospital going, yeah, look at everybody, look at my baby, look at me, you know, starting into that, uh, a, a little bit of that euphoria and that manic phase, which I hadn't had in 10 years. So I had no idea that was happening. I think the only thing my, my mother knew that there was something definitely wrong. And um, so I would, I would definitely, you know, you got to set up, I would set up doctor appointments uh, if I could go back and do it all over again, I would have psych appointments set up um, and and counseling set up way ahead of time. So you're like extra prepared. You've got all your psych appointments set up for the next two months straight, right? Because after you have a child, you're so tired and worn out. Um, I would have counseling appointments set up twice a week. Uh, if I could redo things, I would have... Um, I would have some type of helper to come in and um, help you with meals or laundry. And if you can't afford that, I would have a family member and say, look, I, I need your help for the next couple months to manage the, the, what's going to happen ahead. And, and maybe this doesn't happen to every mom, but the chances are um, when you have bipolar, uh, things are going to happen because those hormones are, they flip your brain so much that um, unfortunately for us, for people with bipolar, um, you know, you just, it's a, it's a high risk to have a child. And so if you can go into it more <clears throat> being prepared for the madness of ahead, instead of, again, being like me where, oh yeah, that's not going to happen. I'm, I'm so on top of this. And um, that's not the reality of the situation. Um, uh, I wish I could tell you differently, but the reality is you have got to put a massive plan in place uh, on all, all ends and get ready for the right kinds of medication. You're going to be working with your doctor on all that. And, um, you know, obviously with not breastfeeding, you're going to be feeding with bottles and um, just maybe learning some things about, I had no idea even how to take care of a baby. I'd never been around kids. I wish I would have known, just maybe <laughs> read some books or something. I, I, I honestly thought I was just a pro about everything. Um, <laughs> and I, I didn't know anything. And I even thought that I was going to run my day spa and and be a mom. And obviously there was no way I could work and be a new mother. That, that was, that, that's another thing. It's like, if you think you're going to work and have a little newborn, um, I just don't see it. Um, especially when it's, it's such a severe illness. So I would, um, if looking back again, I would have just 
eliminated that right away. Um, you can work uh, in, you know, in life a long time down the road. Um, and it's, it's best to try to get rid of as many stressors as you can. And, um, you know, or maybe, maybe your decision is if you have bipolar one or two, um, your decision is I'm, I'm not going to have a child, which, uh, I remember years and years ago, maybe 15 years ago, that's when I, in, in LA and came K Remsfield Jameson was asked that question. And she said, you know, I, I have bipolar one, I have a big job. Um, I try to manage my illness well, and I chose not to have a child. So, um, for each person, it's, it's a huge decision. Um, and, and I would take it so seriously. I would not just shine it on like I did. Um, so that's where, I mean, of course now, uh, you know, I've got my life back and, and I, Allie's my entire life. I love her and, and I was able to keep my marriage. Um, but, but it was very severe and, um, you know, there was, like I said, I would totally change a lot of things if I could go back in time. All right. I think that filters perfectly into our next question um, because you mentioned having a plan. Uh, so what, um, let's see, what do you mean by putting into place a plan for when you have a child and when you have bipolar disorder? Yeah. So, so I, one time I heard this guy uh, speak, I can't remember his name, but I loved it. He, he, uh, the way he put it was, um, well, his wife had had episodes and he said in his talk, if for the next time when his wife had another episode, they were going to have a plan in place from her. And I loved that because I, I would tell everyone that same thing. So you, that's where I'm saying like you write out your doctor's phone number because when you're sick, you're not going to be able to help your husband. You're not going to be able to help your mom and dad or your friends or whoever, whoever's helping you, you're sick. So you're out of the equation. I'm out of the equation. I was so sick that I thought that, you know, I had to drink a certain amount of drinks to keep somebody alive. Right. So I was so out of it that there was no way I'm going to tell somebody the phone number for my doctor, right? I couldn't even figure out how to go to the restroom. My my husband, it was so bad for us that I was in Depends for two months. I didn't even know how to go to the bathroom. So when you're the sick person, there's no there's no hope and help coming from you to your family, to your loved ones. So I would say beforehand, you're this is where you're writing everything out. You're writing all these phone numbers, helplines. Um, Hey, if, if I'm showing these symptoms, I give you permission to get me to this place. And, and wherever you are in the country, you, you find those spots, um, in the back of my book, my runaway, uh, mom book, there is half of this book is full of resources. Uh, more than half of the book is full of resources in here of doctors, clinics, um, all those kinds of places. So you want to uh, do the research and get those places, you know, ready for your loved ones. So if you do get sick, um, then they have they have a plan in action. They go, okay, you know, uh, Samantha's not well. This is what she said we got to do. And and uh, it's like if you were in a coma, right? Your family takes over. They have to make all the decisions. It's the same thing with a psychosis. When you're in a psychosis, you have no idea what's going on. Um, for me, it was so severe that, you know, I thought if I took my clothes off and ran down the street in the middle of Hillcrest, which is close to downtown San Diego, that by doing that, I was going to keep more people alive, right? So um, a psychosis is extremely severe. You don't know what you're doing. I wouldn't even know if I threw out Allie out a window. Um, that's, you know, you hear these stories of, of moms um, killing their little babies and, and they don't know that they're doing it. They're so ill 
that um, these these sad stories come out in the news. And um, that's, you know, really made me want to write the second book so people could have um, help like out of this book, it not only does it have the story, but it has all those resources for moms out there, um, for even for the moms having baby blues. It's not not just about the psychosis or bipolar, but baby blues. Like so many moms feel so alone out there, and they're like, "Man, why aren't why aren't I having those connections with my child?" And if you can get into support groups, you know, we have NAMI out there. We have International Bipolar Foundation. Uh, we have DBSA. Um, I'm sure there's also mom support groups as well out there. And um, after I did get started to get well from my uh, from my psychosis, and then I just hit regular postpartum, which was devastating in itself, right? So I came from crazy psychosis into the postpartum. Um, you know, what helped me most um, coming out of that was connecting with other moms and realizing I wasn't so alone. And, and even with the, with the baby blues and the postpartum, uh, however you want to call it, um, there were other moms experiencing the same thing. And in every town, uh, especially with the internet now, they have these mom groups you can be a part of. And Matt made me go to these mom groups. And I was always kind of that strange mom with the plastic bag coming in. <laughs> and a diaper and like a little snack. <laughs> That's, I could not, and my eyes were barely open from all the drugs I was on or the medication, not drugs, but from the medication. Um, but those moms, they were, they were lifesavers and, um, and, and made me feel part of the team. Um, so I would even put that in, in your plan of action. So, you know, depending on what happens after you have a child, in your plan, you have a, also a plan of how can I manage having a baby at home? How can I get out and exercise and do things? Um, so from your plan, you have to come up with strategies, which we can go into as well. I can talk about that. All righty. So I have one more question for you. And then after um, we talk about this. We're going to jump into Q&A, so everybody, please submit your questions now. Um, but before then, we're going. Here's our final question. So, what are your personal coping strategies for being a bipolar? Yeah, for sure. So, I have a lot of um, coping skills. Um, uh, number one, of course, with bipolar disorder, I am a major believer in medication. I have not seen people thrive without medicine. Um, so I am a massive believer in medication. I just don't think it's possible. I have friends that I know that say, oh, you know, you can take uh, herbs and different things. And if you just eat right, if you just do this, if you do that, um, I think that, yeah, you can try those things, but you, overall you're going to have uh, a massive depression hits you or you're going to have an, uh, another manic episode hit you and why go through that pain. Um, so if you can learn, I hope you can learn today from this that um, medication is key and sometimes it's going to take months. Sometimes it takes a year. Um, the brain is extremely complex, so you have to be patient. Um, and once you do get on that right medication, I think counseling is excellent. I go in and out of counseling um, in my life. Uh, sometimes I take a break because I'm like, oh, I'm doing pretty good. And I, and, and I tell my counselor, I won't see you for a while. Um, but when I start to slip off that path, um, I you know schedule a bunch of counseling appointments and I'll do like once a week for eight weeks and she kind of lines me back out. Uh, so I think that's huge with mental health. It's good to have someone else kind of uh, letting you know, you know, where you're where you're veering off um, instead of family members and friends, uh, but with bipolar you always think you're right. <laughs> so my, it's nice to hear, you know, from a professional. Even though I always think I'm a professional, I'm like, oh, no, I'm really not. Um, so the counselor and your psychiatrist both is is great. Um, and then you know your meds, of course, they're going to keep you. 
um, in that even keel. But I still, and I'm sure some of you out there have those ups and downs. Uh, and I can't take um, any antidepressants for a uh, bipolar disorder because it'll make me manic. So during those low times, I found all kinds of things over the 22 years that I've dealt with this. Uh, last year, I had a really bad depression. It just set in and I couldn't figure out what the deal was. And um, my psychiatrist, she said, Maggie, try, um, try one of those lights. And I, and I did, I bought one of those lights on Amazon and, and it really helped. I stuck it right next to my head about 20 minutes a day. And it just kind of perked up my brain a little bit. And, um, you know, that was this one little element, right? And then it was like, I never stay in bed. I can't tell you enough how that will not help you no matter how badly you feel laying in bed all day uh, just makes it worse. Um, so even on my worst days, I always get out of bed and um, I just make it into that shower and, and take a hot shower, get your hair done, um, get your makeup on if you're a woman or if you're a guy, you know, get on an outfit and, and get out and take a walk if you if you're able to do that. And whether it's a block down the street or a mile or you know, whatever it is. Um, I don't run at all. I just walk and I, I just take in the fresh air and the sunshine, or if you have to be in Seattle, you know, put your glasses on and, and trudge through the rain. But I guarantee you those endorphins start going and you feel better. Um, yesterday, for instance, uh, I have a lot of back issues. So I've had back surgery at 36 years old and now I'm 42 and I, I have two more discs in my back that are starting to crumble away. And, you know, that's kind of depressing, right? So, but instead of falling into a depression over my physical problems, um, I'm like, you know what, there's, I'm not going to do more surgeries, but I, I'm going to attack this the best way I know. And, and now I'm swimming. So this week I'm, I'm attacking the gym and I'm going, going to that pool and jumping in the water and, and I'm doing some swimming and I, and I'm not even a swimmer. I just, uh, I run across the pool back and forth and watch all the amazing swimmers swim past me. But, uh, when I got out of that pool, the smile on my face was awesome. And then when I came home, my daughter was like, Hey mom, you're, you're looking good today. And I'm like, thanks. And, and it was because my brain was working, right? My endorphins are going and uh, my husband even noticed a difference. Uh, so exercise, as you all know, is so key. Uh, I, I do like paddle boarding and I do yoga. I try to stay active and I do all these things, even though I am in a lot of pain physically. Um, but, you know, I'm trying to combat a couple different things here. Um, but I feel like you've got to you've got to get out of bed and you've got to win your race every day um, because it is a race. Right. And, and you can't give up. And um, what would the point of that be uh, giving up? It's just not an option. I always say it's never an option to give up. Uh, you have to fight just like if you had cancer, or diabetes, you're a fighter. You have to be a fighter. And uh, my my biggest coping skill for me i'm not trying to preach to people out there but i'm i'm a big believer in jesus i go to church every sunday it's something i look forward to i love to sing <laughs> so i'm always singing at church i'm a terrible singer um back when i was 19 i used to sing karaoke because i thought i was famous and i'm not, obviously not <laughs> i'm really bad um but i like to sing at church and i get so much out of church and i like to go to my bible studies on thursdays um, I just have this caring group of women that I meet every Thursday. Um, in my book, uh, Runaway Mom, it talks about my faith um, and what it's done for me. Um, so, you know, the, again, those are the, those are things that help me. I hope that some of you um, will take away some of these little tidbits, um, whether it's a walk or a hot shower or, you know, getting out of bed. Um, you know, taking timeouts for yourself, especially if you're a mom, you've got to be able to take timeouts and uh, just let your child know, you know, if you're st starting to feel all that stress and that pressure, because obviously, you know, my daughter's 11 now and she knows like, you know, 
if I'm starting to have those that stress, which the stress makes all your problems worth worse with bipolar, she's like, Mom, it's okay, just I'm fine. I'm gonna go. She knows all about my bipolar. Allie's Allie's like a little pro kid on that. <laughs> she knows, okay, mom's gonna go have her time out, just like you have to give your kids timeouts. So it's okay if you know, for me, I take little trips every year to get away, <laughs> whether it's a couple days or a week or whatever. Um, I just do that to recharge so I can be a good mom. And then I'm not the yelling mom that I don't want Allie to grow up with um, my illness affecting her. So I go 180 degrees the other way uh, and, you know, contain my temper. <laughs> I think Matt, Matt, my husband, uh, probably gets the worst of my temper. And I'm really late, lately, I'm really trying to work on that. Uh, and I have to learn to apologize and, you know, things like that. So remember, again, with the coping strategies, you've always, when you do get out of line, you've got to be able to say sorry. It's, it's huge in relationships. Um, and even, even with your kids, if, if you get out of line, you've got to be able to you know, say, Hey, I'm sorry. You know, let's, let's move on and let's, you know, let's get over that. And so, you know, and give yourself lots of praise to that. You know, you're a survivor. You're doing it. You're fighting it. All right. Wonderful. So we're going to jump into some audience questions now. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few built up. So we'll start with this one. As your child gets older, what's the best way to talk about your bipolar? Yeah, so um, with Allie, uh, we've kept it as a discussion since she was four. And uh, I just, I don't know, as she was little, I just always explained <clears throat> exactly what it was. So she's grown up with knowing that I have low lows and high highs. And um, she knows that I, like I was just saying, that I need lots of breaks. And um she sometimes goes, Mom, do you, am I going to get that? And and I do let her know, you know, I said, well, you have this percentage chance of getting it. And I tell her, look, we can't worry about the future because we don't know, you know, if you're going to get that. And if you do, then we're going to tackle it just like my family tackled it with me. And um, so I she's grown up a very confident child. Uh, in our house uh, because we do keep it as an open topic. When things arise <clears throat> with my health or when I hear about other people, we do talk about it at the dinner table. We're a family that sits down every night at the dinner table and discuss. we discuss everything. And uh, one of her uh, best friends the other day in middle school, um, her other friend that Allie doesn't know, um, it was, uh, she heard about a, you know, this girl cutting herself. She's like, mom, why would somebody do that? And, and when those kind of things come up, that's where you address them and you talk about it at the dinner table and say, Hey, you know, that's not something we do. And this is why they're doing that. And if, if you ever see that we, we go to an adult so we can help those parents and that child. Um, so from the start, we've been open and honest with Allie, and um, she is not scared of my illness, and her friends all know I have it too. So it's, I'm just, I've always been open about it, and it's more freeing that way. It's like, this is, this is what you get. All right, great. So the next one is, let me see here, what signs do you look for for bipolar disorder in your child? Yeah, I I definitely um, I I know um, some people um, in my own community where their kids do have uh, bipolar disorder, and it kind of creeps up on them. And I mean, it's it's very scary for a parent um, to realize there's something wrong with their kid. And uh, and and you know, Matt and I always discuss in our own home. It's like, man, we hope we see the signs, right? I mean, here I am the pro, but sometimes when you're the pro, you don't see it happening in your own home. Um, but with some friends of mine, uh, they saw their kid go from, you know, just acting normal every day to withdrawing from activities, withdrawing from friends. 
um, the, their work at school started to slump. It, usually you can see it with the grades. Uh, you can see the kid start to spend more time in their room. Um, all of a sudden their appearance starts to change. Uh, they don't care what they look like anymore most of the time. Um, they don't want to take showers. They don't want to get ready for the day. They don't even want to go to school. Um, if it, it, you know, that's more going towards the depression side. They don't want to talk to people. Uh, anxiety sets in, you know, just to make it under the car. They're like, please don't, don't take me, don't take me. And um, this is what I've seen with friends of mine. And, and it is so heartbreaking because parents don't know what to do. Um, and for me, I'm always saying, well, you've got to get them to a psychiatrist. You've got to get them a counselor. You've got to start um, all the different avenues of getting help and, and, the, and the professionals take it from there. Uh, and if it's uh, more the manic side, the, the signs would be, you know, the erratic behavior. And it almost looks like uh, your kid is like on drugs, but they're not. If you know they're, they're not taking drugs. Or sometimes it can be drugs with mania. Um, so they're, they're on drugs or alcohol, and then it sets off a manic episode. So then you're dealing with a dual diagnosis and you've got two things um, happening, which is even more devastating to try to correct because you're dealing with the drugs or the alcohol plus the mania, uh, which is so difficult for parents um, to try to manage their child, especially if they're a boy. I find that it's even more difficult because boys tend to be very ashamed if they do have an illness, whether it's depression or OCD uh, or schizoaffective, bipolar, whatever it may be. And um, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's just, it's something with the brain that is wrong. And then um, thank goodness that we have doctors out there to help us. Um, so we, you know, if we were back in Van Gogh's day, there, there was no help. Uh, I've been to that hospital in France where he was chained up in a, um, in a bathtub for cold treatment. So I'm glad we don't have to be there. All right, that's true. Um... The next one is, do you have any tips for channeling manic energy into exercise? Channeling manic energy into? Exercise, sorry, did, you, oh. did it not catch the last word? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I, when I do get on those more highs for me, um, I do channel it into, um, I mean, for me, I can't do too much exercise because that's where my all my physical problems arise. So I uh, I channel it into my work. So I do facials and massage, and I, I've always worked for myself. I got into that work uh, because it was a a job that I can always manage, and I wouldn't be fired from since I'm the boss. <laughs> so after college uh, at 24, I opened my first business, and I've been in and out of that work from then all the way until now. And um, so, you know, when I need, when I have more energy, I tend to book more people and I stay busy that way. And um, I also, I run a dog boarding business on the side. And so I, I like to board dogs at my home. I have an acre of land. So that's always keeping me busy. And I'm, I'm only a mile from my house for my little day spa. So I'm back and forth between facials and massage and then running the dogs around uh, because in the spring and the summer, I have a lot of energy. In the summer, I, I, uh, I rent my house out on VRBO and I, we leave every summer for six weeks. And that's where, um, so we make money that way. And, and we go to Idaho and Montana. We do a lot of fly fishing. So I channel a lot of my energy into um, being in the great outdoors with my family and uh, this new love of fly fishing. I never thought I could actually concentrate on that, um, but I find it very relaxing to be on those big rivers, uh, to be where there's no internet or there's no smartphones and nobody is bothering me. <laughs> and I swear it's like the best thing ever for bipolar people. If you can like check out uh, on a place like that where 
there is no uh, cell service. Oh my gosh, I feel like my brain just goes to this relaxing state of calm. Uh, so summers are my favorite time of year uh, to just to be away and, and to check out. So if you can, if you can do that, um, that's great for the mania too, because mania gets very tiresome. All right, um, let's do one more question and then <clears throat> we will close out. So the last one is, do you incorporate any natural treatments or remedies into your routine? Uh, yeah, I don't take any um, natural supplements, uh, but I do, um, I am starting to get like uh, acupuncture, so I'm gonna start getting into that. Uh, I. I did try it years ago and I felt like it helped my stress level. Um, so, and, I, and I'm also, since I am a massage therapist, I haven't been getting massage for myself, but uh, starting soon, I'm gonna make myself go get a massage. Um, so I, I do feel like the more you're able to manage your stress, uh, the better your illness is gonna be. Um, so, you know, the more stress that we get, uh, you know, not only does it affect your bipolar disorder, but it affects your body in other ways as well. And as we're finding out with research that, you know, stress causes, uh, cancer and heart disease and, you know, all these other things out there. Um, so people with bipolar disorder, you know, a lot of them in their uh, later years end up getting all these other ailments <clears throat> and it's a lot of it is due to stress. So if you can figure out how to manage that stress now, um, whether it's, you know, you are taking some supplements and I would always go through your doctor with all of those, whatever you're doing, because sometimes supplements can mess with your regular medication. Um, I probably at some point need to attack that. And, um, you know, diet is huge. I'm still to this day trying to work on my diet. Uh, sometimes I'll go the whole day without eating, which is terrible to do. Um, and, you know, so then I'm just running on the like Starbucks coffee really bad. <laughs> like today. So, you know, there's, you can always like keep learning. So my diet, um, I'm going to really, really try to, uh, get in there and, you know, eat a little sandwich instead of skipping lunch. Um, and, uh, for breakfast, you know, my husband's always leaving a hard boiled egg there every day. So maybe I'll start eating it. <laughs> I really need to do that. I always eat dinner. I'm really good at that. But I would say diet is so huge. Um, and, and when you skip those meals, it's so bad for your brain. And that's where, you know, you can get like, you can get angry and things like that. And, and all those things set off little um, stuff that's not good for you. So, um, you know, uh, whatever those things that you can find that help manage your stress uh, would be great. And, uh, and it'll help you in the long run when you, when you are older with bipolar, um, uh, you know, you don't, you don't need all these other things to compounding with the bipolar, you know, bipolar alone's enough. <laughs> all right. Thank you. So we're going to close out in just a minute, but I want to give you a chance to give maybe some farewell tips to everybody, maybe a quick synopsis of some you know, key points in your speech about managing, about it takes a village. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it to you for that. Yeah, definitely. So again, um, you know, if, if you are thinking about having a child, uh, remember what I said about uh, putting a huge plan in place and writing it all down for your family. Because if, if you do get sick like I did, you are not going to be able to tell them anything. So, um, and if you're already a mom and you have bipolar disorder, um, maybe, you know, seek like some uh, help from friends and try to figure out where can I take some of my stress away? Uh, because when you already are a mom and you've got, sometimes you have two or three kids, 
um, it is very difficult uh, on you. So maybe uh, don't be the PTA class president, you know? <laughs> like I remember my mom saying, Maggie, don't be the PTA girl. And I remember going, no, mom, I could totally be the PTA president. And uh, I'm so glad that I actually listened to my mom. And um, in school, I would only volunteer for a couple things, you know? And uh, so just be okay with saying no out there. Um, if you already are um, a mom and, and you have kids in school, um, just getting the kids school, uh, just getting the kids to school in the morning, like that's amazing that you, you're doing that. You know, that's awesome that you're out of bed, you're fixing lunch for your kid and you're able to drop them off and then get back home and, and then maybe take a, an hour breather for yourself. And um, if you're a working mom and have bipolar, um, hopefully you can figure out a schedule that's that you're not overdoing it. And um, I and I know there's all kinds of uh, limitations out there where you're like, well, I have to make this much money or this or that. Um, but if there is ways to um, cut down on on that for yourself, it's going to help your family in tremendous ways. Not only your children, but your husband. Or your boyfriend or, or whatever your situation may be, uh, the more, um, again, you're able to uh, have that plan if you're not a mom yet, or if you're already a mom, make, write out some things to help manage the stress. And uh, it's just really going to help you overall. And, and, and sometimes uh, it's great to have a me day. If you can carve out a whole day where you are not uh, doing everything for everybody um but you're just like okay you know today i'm just gonna i'm just gonna walk the dog and i'm gonna go see a movie and i'm just gonna relax if if there is a time where you can have something like that to just chill out recharge and then get back in you'll be a better mom for your kids and and again if you don't have a kid uh right now and you do want to have a kid Remember all these factors and risks. Um, and I don't mean to scare you all with um, this, but um, def and definitely read my book. That'll that'll help give you perspective. Um, so it's it's on Amazon and it's called Runaway Mom, and um, and uh, you know share that with others. And and if you just have regular bipolar and you just want to learn more about that, Runaway Mind helps a lot of parents. Um, and um, young people m figure out how to manage their bipolar and uh, um, you know all those those coping strategies are in that first book as well the second book you're going to have more for the for the postpartum psychosis and the help for that but both of these books um, i wrote them um, you know now here they are to just to help you guys and and i hope it does so um, you know and I hope something from today has helped you uh, figure out your journey or help your kid, or if you you know need to go back and get them to listen, um, you know, the better you can manage uh, your life, the more successful you'll be in every aspect of your life. Okay, thank you so much for today's um, interview. That was wonderful. I'm gonna pass it off to our program coordinator, Aubrey. And she's going to go a little bit down on a big event that we have coming up soon. Hi, everybody. This is Aubrey Good, Program Coordinator here at International Bipolar Foundation. I just wanted to first thank Maggie for coming on and sharing her story. Um, this is a really important topic, and we're so glad she's brave enough to speak about it. And leading into um, our next topic, World Bipolar Day, which is March 30th, we would like all of you to participate and share your own stories, similar to how Maggie has, uh, with a statement on how living with bipolar disorder has made you bipolar strong. Please go to www.ibpf.org to participate and submit your photos or 20 to 30 second videos. And we also encourage caregivers, family, organizations, et cetera, to come out and support those living with bipolar disorder so we can show the world that we are bipolar strong. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you everybody for joining us and we hope you have a great day.